Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to the Liberty Report. With me today is Daniel McAdams, who's the Executive Director of the Institute for Peace and Prosperity. Daniel, good to see you today. Good morning, Dr. Paul. Oh, very good. Today we have a very special guest. Indeed. And a real expert on libertarianism, somebody I've known for a good many years. She's been an activist in libertarian politics, and she's been active in uh, biophysics. She has a PhD in biophysics, she has done a lot of biomedical research. Very interested in the FDA and writing a book on that. But uh, first, I want to uh, welcome Mary Ruart uh, today to our show. Well, thank you. It's great to be here. <laughs> Wonderful. I, I want to start off by um, first mentioning the, <clears throat> the book that I'm most familiar with and the most recent one that uh, you wrote. <clears throat> it's called uh, Healing Our World. And uh, this is a wonderful book. It's a continuation of Mary's writings because I think her first book on this was way back in 1992, and she follows the same libertarian theme in each of these books. But uh, this is a very good book uh, for people who are interested in really understanding what libertarianism is all about. But Mary, before we get into some of the details of uh, how we present the case for libertarianism, uh, tell us uh, a little bit about how, how you got started. Uh, I, I sometimes tell people I was born a libertarian, even though I didn't know what it was. But how did you get introduced and really fascinated where you became an activist uh, for libertarianism? Well, when I was in college, I read Ayn Rand's books, and that's really what got me started. Before then, I guess you'd probably describe me as... Uh, somewhat conservative fiscally, but liberal in the sense that I wanted to help the poor. And when I realized that putting a gun to somebody's head and taking their money <laughs> to help the poor was less loving than simply letting them be, even if they were selfish and didn't want to help the poor, then I really got it. So I was, I was on fire after that. Well, you know, your theme uh, in your book, of course, this book is Healing Our World. This obviously implies that the libertarian principle, and you talk about it, the non-aggression principle, uh, is, is a solution to many of our problems. And uh, did that all just pop up at one time, or did that sort of get developed? Because it's something that uh, I, I think it took me a while to evolve my thinking and study and try and put it all together and find out it really does solve a lot of our problems. Well, it took me a while too. It, it was, it came after I had been active in the party for many years. And one day I was reading about our foreign policy and wondering why all of our foreign aid just seemed to backfire. And all of a sudden it came together. The ends and means are intimately related. If you, you use bad ends, taxation, for example, to give foreign aid to other countries, you can almost be assured that bad things will happen because you're using bad means to start. And once I saw that and saw, as I talked about earlier, that the libertarian philosophy of non-aggression was really the political expression of loving one's neighbor, it all came together for me. And I was so excited. I, was, I could hardly stop smiling for about a week because what I also saw was that a libertarian world is inevitable. You know, we all want a world where we have universal uh, plenty, universal abundance. We don't want anyone starving. And, and we want peace. And really, the libertarian philosophy is the only thing that can give us that. Well, your expression of excitement and pleasure once you dis you discover this is reminds me of the way it worked for me because when I discovered Austrian economics, I was so fascinated with. It. But da Daniel, uh, do you have a question for Mary? I, I do actually, and this is something, Dr. Paul, that we've struggled with not only on this show but for for a number of years. We've worked with progressives over the years, and one of the the age-old questions, and I'm glad you mentioned it very early on, Dr. Ruart. Uh, you talk about you wanted to help the poor. You've actually worked with the poor. I know at least in Kalamazoo, Michigan, you were involved in helping with low-income housing. Uh, and you've actually, uh, <clears throat> you know, walked the walk in addition to talking the talk. But, you know, libertarianism is accused often by progressives of not caring about the poor, of not having any compassion. Uh, probably a lot of us are our own worst enemies on this. But if you can, maybe explain how in a libertarian world the poor may be better taken care of than they are in a world where, as you point out, the government holds a gun to people's heads, 
takes our money, gives some of it to the poor, and keeps a lot of it for themselves. Well, I think the most important thing to remember is poverty, as we know it today, is a creation of government. The poor are put out of work by regulations uh, that make it hard for them to get into the workforce, especially as entrepreneurs. And I saw this when I rented to low-income people. I had a couple tenants who were doing sewing in their homes, their apartments, or child care, which was fine with me. But it wasn't fine with the city government. They called me and asked me to evict them. And, and I said, well, what are these people going to do if you shut them down? And they said, well, they should go on welfare. <laughs> That's what they should be doing. And, and actually, they hounded these women so much. I, I, of course, did not evict them. But they hounded them so much that eventually the women said, hey, it's not worth it the hassle. We're going to quit what we're doing and we're going to go on welfare. And they did. Now, how sad. Somebody could support themselves, wanted to support themselves, and were literally pushed out of business by government. And this is the main problem today. That's how poverty is created. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Mary, I want to ask a question. You said you mentioned Anne Rand and her books, like so many of us have read uh, her writings. And of course, I read all of them. And I got her newsletter for years and years, uh, yes. e even when uh, our friend Greenspan was writing favorably about <laughs> gold and these other things. But uh, it was also one of the challenges for me because she put, you know, a compassionate society, a Christian society that would actually go out and give to the poor. She associated that and used the word altruism, but she identified almost in a blanket sense that uh, any type of giving, she applied it at least, it might be not exactly what she was saying, but that was the image she gave, was equal to communism. So did, <laughs> did, did you, uh, how do you resolve that? You had to have thought about that a little bit, about her attitude. Do you think, yes. do you think uh, some people misunderstand her, or does she uh, sort of paint uh, voluntary altruism a little bit <laughs> in a negative way? <laughs> Well, I, I did feel a little put off by that kind of thing, uh, even when I was enjoying and, and being enlightened by her. I think this is one area where she might have maybe not quite had everything together. I mean, and the other area is, of course, the judgment thing. You know, she said, judge and be prepared to be judged. And, you know, of course, I guess maybe I take a more... Um, liberal approach in that I think judgment actually backfires on the person that has it. And as far as the poor goes, I think there there is an, a normal compassion that we have for people who are in trouble and we want to help them. And if we have that urge, uh, then it's appropriate. I think one of the things that Rand is a little misunderstood about, she, she didn't have any trouble, I don't think, if you wanted to help someone, but the idea was you were supposed to benefit from it yourself by feeling good <laughs> or, or um, getting an uplift or, or, or maybe doing it because in the future you thought you might need something from that person. I, I don't think it's necessary to think that way. I think that's kind of an automatic law of the universe, so to speak, that if you're helpful to people, um, when you're not when you're forced to do it, <laughs> but when the spirit moves you, I, I think uh, good things come from that for you. And it, it's not that you do it because good things come to you, but it's just a natural outgrowth of, of uh, the compassion, really, that, that most human beings have for others. Maybe, maybe the outgrowth of being a good neighbor. <laughs> yes, and that's what we call, in healing our world, I call it that, being a good neighbor. I mean, yeah. there's just, it's natural. It's natural to love. It's not, it's not something that, even somebody you don't know, I think it's natural to um, have that, quote, universal love. Uh, you might not love them personally, but you wish them well anyway. Right. Dr. Ruh, one of the things that fascinated me about uh, your, your bio is that you are a well-respected uh, scientist of very high achievement, yet you went on to specialize in helping to train other scientists to communicate with the rest of us <laughs> who don't understand that language. And, and I think that makes you a wonderful communicator to be able to bridge those two worlds. And I think it's fascinating. Um, you've also been so effective as an activist, but you've also been uh, a candidate for many offices. You've run and you've embraced politics as well as education and activism. 
at, at the risk of moving into political territory maybe a little earlier than we wanted to, I was wondering if you could uh, let us know a little bit about what you're thinking of those, because there, there is a tension, obviously, between politics and activism, and where, where, where do you fall, maybe, particularly at this particular juncture? Mm -hmm. Well, I think I've always felt that running for office was an ideal platform for educating people about libertarianism. And since I started running in 1983, that's, you know, what we did back then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but as far as uh, moving forward, I think one of the things we've found that because just of the way the system's set up, it's very hard for libertarians to get elected. But it's very easy for libertarians to roll back big government without electing anyone. And that's something we don't celebrate or encourage the way we should. You know, when when I ran for city commission in 83, I wasn't running as a libertarian, but the press figured if they called me a libertarian and smeared me that way, then no one would pay attention. Well, it, it backfired because then I had to explain the entire libertarian philosophy throughout my candidacy, and people got it. So then when the city tried to take property by eminent domain and have this big bond issue to reroute the railroad tracks, which was a big boondoggle. When I attended a meeting, a gentleman came up to me and he put $200 in cash in my hand before he spoke a word to me. And he said, Dr. Ruart, I know your employer is going to benefit by this eminent domain grab, but Dr. Ruart, you are a libertarian, so I know you're on my side. So take this money and fight and, and try to make sure they don't take my bicycle shop. Mm -hmm. um, that is an incredible uh, trust that someone has, uh, especially since I had conflicts of interest, obviously. <laughs> right. And that's the inspiration, I think, that, that liberty gives people. It really does. If we share the non-aggression principle and the message, we'll be the people they come to when big government comes knocking on our door, and we fought that and won. So, you know, that's what we are good at as libertarians. You know, in, in the years that I've spent uh, in politics, I'm sure you've had this come across in, in your discussions with those individuals who are trying to persuade to come in our direction. And that is that they have been taught, you know, in our universities, in our schools and condition, that we as libertarians are just selfish individualists and we don't care about the public interest. And they see the public interest, you know, in a very special way. And when they see it in the way that I'm describing, how do you approach that? How do you take a, a liberal who say, you know, we care about the public interest. How do you handle that type of a question? Well, I usually ask for specifics because if they, they have a specific thing they want to talk about, then I have a lot of facts and figures at my fingertips. As you know, there's like over a thousand references in Healing Our World, <laughs> and I can show them, hey, you know, it works better when it's done privately. And, and that's really... Yeah, that's really, I think, what persuades people. I've had liberals come up, up to me after I've given a talk and said, oh, my gosh, I realize all my life I've been hurting the people I'm trying to help. And that's really, of course, what government does when it tries to get involved in helping people. It actually hurts the very people that they're trying to help. And, and it's it's an incredible um, eye-opening uh, experience for, for people when they get that. So that's what I try to do. Yeah, and of course, when they're thinking about the public interest, they never say, who defines the public interest? All, all of us as individuals, or do I get to define the public interest? And they're usually thinking only smart people who are the bureaucrats and the politicians. They're the smart ones, and they'll tell us what the public interest is, and all of a sudden it turns out to be very special interests uh, uh, that they're talking about. Daniel? Well, Dr. Rue, I don't want to... Uh put you in an uncomfortable position, but if you're comfortable talking a little bit about the Libertarian Party, which you've been involved with uh, for, for many, many years, uh, there are a lot of people that have been concerned uh, with the candidacy this year, um, even the candidates beforehand. You know, I know you've been very, uh, very big on pushing the non-aggression principle. One of the candidates explicitly rejected the idea of a non-aggression principle. Yesterday, in light of Orlando, the uh, vice presidential candidate for the Libertarian Party said, we need a thousand person task force to fight ISIS, which sounds a lot like escalation. He also wants a hotline where Muslims can snitch on other Muslims that they think are suspicious. Um, and the, the presidential candidate has uh, once again repeated this idea, which I think turns off so many natural libertarians, of just saying we are fiscally conservative but socially liberal. 
-hmm. Do you think there's any future in the Libertarian Party, or are we just in a very bad patch? Well, that's a good question. You know, that's a good question. When the party was young, it was the only entree into the movement. And luckily, I think we kept the non-aggression principle pretty much in the fore during that time. Now there are other ways to get in. So my hope is that we continue to be the party of principle. But if we aren't, um, I'm grateful that there's other things out there. We, we are in kind of a fight for our soul, if you will. I mean, because in a way, we've gotten so excited about the idea of maybe winning office that we've forgotten, I think, to some extent why we're here. We're not, the Libertarian Party isn't here to win office. The Libertarian Party here is here to um, bring back the non-aggression principle to our nation and to really take care of those places where it wasn't applied. You know, in other words, we're trying to have a cultural change here. Whether we get elected or not is irrelevant. Now, a lot of people believe the only way we can do it is to get elected. I do not subscribe to that. I think when when you have a cultural shift, the politics will follow. And I think it's going to be very hard for libertarians to become elected until that happens. And Dr. Paul, you you know that. I mean, <laughs> they, they broke the rules for you uh, when <laughs> you got all those states when you were running for president so you could get the GOP nomination and what happened? They changed the rules at the last minute. And that's the game that's played. And that game will be continued to be played until people say, you know, we don't want this anymore. So I think our job here is to get people behind us and the rest comes naturally. You know, I, I think you, you have, you've put it together because this is exactly the issue. I always talk about the prevailing attitude of the people and it will influence the people uh, in, in Washington. And you say, well, maybe we've already had some victories. Why shouldn't we celebrate them? I think we had a lot to do with uh, moving this country in the direction of uh, marijuana and drug usage and the war on drugs uh, without endorsing. <laughs> of course, I, I, was, I steered clear of the endorsement of the use of these uh, psychotropic drugs and what they do with them. But not it was easy to paint the war on drugs as being very bad. So yes. we, we've done something there, and uh, I, I hope we can claim a little bit of credit that we've moved, uh, we've moved the issue on the uh, Federal, Federal Reserve and sound money, and it looks like we're going to gain even more momentum as this economy comes unglued. Well, that's right, and all the discussion about getting rid of the income tax and the IRS, that, that all started with libertarians. When I was out there in the early 80s, no one else was talking about that, <laughs> except libertarians. So we've really changed the, the landscape. And as you know, uh, when you ran for president under the libertarian ticket in 88, people didn't know what the <laughs> libertarian party was. Now it's a household word, and it's, it's kind of ironic, because when you ran, it wasn't known, and then you ran again. <laughs> and and running, you know, uh, with the GOP, but you made libertarianism uh, a household word by doing that. I thought that was pretty ironic. <laughs> in, in your efforts to get people to move toward our position, uh, have you ever come across somebody who would say, yes, I like what you say, I believe in this, but, you know, it's just, I have a little bit of trouble with some of the issues, and they might come up with one particular issue That's and say, <laughs> well, if it wasn't, well, during the campaign it was, yeah, it's good. I like what you're saying, except this foreign policy. We can't apply it to foreign policy. Or they'll pick another subject. Has there been any one issue that you came across that seemed to be one of the last thing you had to convince them of to endorse the complete principle of the non-aggression theory? Well, everybody's different. I mean, I generally start by saying, well, if you agree with us in 99 percent, then then don't you think you should be with us instead of with the Democrats and Republicans with whom you agree much less? <laughs> but really, I don't know of one single issue uh, that people get hung up on, although I will say when the 9-11 happened and uh, we went to war in the Middle East, there were a lot of libertarians who saw that as self-defense, who have now since realized it was maybe not so much self-defense as going after the oil or going after other special interests. So uh, I'm glad to see the shift, but it really it tore the party apart because they saw it as self-defense. So it's, I guess what I'm what I'm getting at here is it's 
And just because you embrace the non-aggression principle doesn't necessarily mean your interpretation is the same as the next person's. And, and that's something we should be discussing in the party. And unfortunately, we tend not to do that so much anymore. Right. We're, we're going to have to close now, but before we do, I want to mention once again your website, and that's Ruhr.com, I believe. And yes. you said that some of your old, other books are available on the website? Yes. The, the uh, edition of Healing Our World that you've been holding up, holding up is the fourth edition. The second edition is free at my website and my free library. So if somebody wants to read a little bit and see, hey, I, I want to see if I like <laughs> this kind of book before I buy it. Okay. <laughs> or if you just want to read the whole thing, it's fine too. And also the fact that you are a biophysicist, worked in the medical industry and research and all, and you uh, are very interested in the FDA, uh, something that I'm very interested in. And I've always detested the fact that, you know, you don't have a voluntary approach to testing new medications and the interconnections of the drug companies and the FDA. And you're doing a book on this. So uh, I think I want to just advise the audience to pay attention and uh, make sure. But we'd like to invite you back again, actually, to talk about the FDA issue uh, in, 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 the, in a principal way, because I think it's such an important issue. Yes, yes. In fact, I think it's an issue that could really be pivotal in getting the American people to see the beauty and the need for the non-aggression principle. So it is something we should talk about. Right. Uh, Mary, thank you very much for being with us today and hope to see you back on our program later on. Oh, I'd love that. Thank you. Okay. And I want to thank the audience today for being with us. And uh, I want to just emphasize that Mary Ruart uh, really, really understands the morality of the non-aggression principle, has applied it, has written about it, has been active and libertarian, and also educational uh, organizations. So I, I want to highly recommend what she is doing and visit her website. And she does a lot of current writing as well. And I want to invite all of you to return to the Ron Paul Liberty Report soon.